So today we are in Parshas Kedoshim, uh, You Shall Be Holy, which is a really wonderful Parsha, talking about the holiness of God's holiness, and he wants us to be holy like him. And we're going to speak about an aspect of it that is really essential. So first of all, there are, Parshat Kedoshim gives a list of commandments for our relationships between man and man. So it says, <clears throat> among other things, it says, you must not hate your brother in your heart. Instead, continually reprove your fellow man, but do not bring sin upon yourself when reproving him. You must not take revenge against any one of the members of your people, but you shall love your fellow man as you love yourself. I am the eternal. <clears throat> so the first of this list of commandments, of which this is just some of them, there's even more before that on this list in Kadoshim, guide us in how to relate to each other not to hate each other in our hearts and not to reprove someone. You should reprove somebody. If somebody does something wrong, you should tell them they did something wrong and you should not take revenge against each other. But the final one of this list says, you shall love your fellow man as you love yourself. This is such an important statement. We're gonna talk about its importance, but the Arizal, the Holy Arizal says, you can see it on his grave in Svat, that we should say every day, every, day, every morning, I take upon myself to love my fellow man. And in Chabad, we say this early in the prayers. Before we say Shema, Hareini mikabel alai mitzvah to say shall be a haftuach I hereby take upon him myself the commandment to love my fellow as myself. So this is so important that this is something we say every day, even before we get to Shema. So with the with regard to this mitzvah of Ahavat Yisrael, should love your fellow Jew. We find two different statements from our sages. So Rabbi Akiva states, love your neighbor as yourself, This is a great general principle in the Torah. Then there was another statement that came from Hillel, who lived generations earlier, and said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your friend. This is the entire Torah and the rest is commentary. So we'll talk about this a little more as we go on. So the difference between the wording of these two statements is obvious. This is a great general principle in Torah, like Rabbi Akiva says, means that Avis Yisrael is one of the Torah's greatest principles. It is even a great general principle, but it's still only one general principle. It's not the general principle of the Torah. But Hillel, by contrast, sees Ahavat Yisrael as the entire Torah. And the remainder is merely commentary. So we'll talk about that in more detail. But the question that we're relating to today is, is it possible to love another person as we love ourselves? And love is a feeling. How do we work on feeling it? The starting words of this Parsha Kiddoshim is be holy like I am holy. So the commandment of this, of the beginning of the Torah is to be holy the way that Hashem is holy. Obviously this takes some work, but what we're going to learn in this Parsha is a big clue in how to do this. The Torah commands us to love our fellow Jew. How, how can we actually be holy and act holy 
and loving our fellow Jew is a big part of this. So we're being told in the Torah to help each other and do what we can for each other. As a matter of fact, the Baal Shem Tov says that sometimes a person comes into the world for 70 years to do one favor for one person. And what happens sometimes, we don't know when that favor is gonna come up and we don't know who that person is that we're doing the favor for. Although sometimes we have a clue, but when we, what it really means is that if there is an opportunity to do something for somebody, then maybe that's the favor we came into the world to do. And you never know. Sometimes you say something to someone who just says something simple and that can change his whole life. You never know. So this is something that people need to work on. And so there are different ways of interacting with each other. Um, the Torah is telling us, so we got some of these mitzvot to tell us how to behave. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. That means we have to work on not carrying grudges, but instead love another. So how do we work on this? Now the Torah is also telling us, rebuke, rebuke your fellow. Don't hate him or bear a grudge, but speak it over with him. Now, when we talk with the other person, then the animosity dissipates. So when we're saying to the person that really was hurtful, I don't know that, I don't think you intended it, but when you said this or that, that was really hard. I just want to let you know that. And the other person very often will say, I didn't realize that. I shouldn't have spoken that way. Sometimes I don't think, and I'm, I'm really sorry for that. And then you straighten out the relationship and the other person also learns maybe when I say things to people who are sensitive or maybe I need to be more sensitive when I'm thinking about what to say to another person. But rebuking somebody does not mean to get rid of our angry feelings onto the other person. Doesn't mean we're supposed to just drop our feelings on them. What kind of thing did you do? Because that's not gonna help but we can speak in private and with soft words, but we have to consider before we tell them what they did, that we feel what was wrong, what is my aim in telling it to them? So that's a big question. Like, because right after that, it says you shall not bear a sin on his account. So you don't wanna tell somebody what kind of idiot are you? You don't wanna do that because you're gonna hurt their feelings. And there's no point to that. And they're not an idiot, even though they hurt your feelings. So you have to think, what is the purpose of what you're going to say? So if you're going to rebuke, that means it has to be for their good that you're not gonna call them a name, that you're going to say, I don't know if you realize, but when you said this, and the way this has to be done, rebuking has to be done carefully, not in public. So what is the end result? Is the end result going to be to change the behavior of the other person or just to get it off my heart? And the halacha is clear. We can only rebuke a person who will listen, not someone who won't hear it and work with it. So if the person who didn't behave well towards you is not open to hearing your rebuke, you still have feelings. What can you do with those feelings so you don't walk around with anger and a grudge? But then when, if that's, there's nothing you can do out there regarding the other person, and you yourself have to work with your own feelings, then it's about yourself. Then it's not about the other person anymore because there's nothing you can do about the other person. They'll learn it when they learn it, or they won't learn it when they won't learn it. But that's not your responsibility anymore. But your own feelings are always your responsibility. So sometimes people need to find somebody to talk to because now it's your own issue. So 
we're all working on growing in such a way that we come to inner peace and are not affected by the behaviors of other people. So that's talking about ourselves, that we have to have our inner peace and realize that when God puts someone into our lives, there is a purpose for it. And sometimes we grow from things that don't even seem obviously good. Sometimes somebody says something and I remember some a long, long time ago, somebody said to me, but what if that's true? I said, no, no way. But what if it's true about this particular subject somehow stayed in my background? And even though at the time I said, no, it's not true, I believed it wasn't true, at the right time, it came into my consciousness to say, what if it is true? I need to figure that out. And that turned out to be very important and helpful for me. So sometimes when somebody speaks kindly to another person and they don't feel rebuked, they feel guided, possibly they can help them. But sometimes the reason that we met that person, the person said what they said, was so that we could come to our own inner peace and realize, no, I don't have to think about that person. I have to think, what can I grow from this situation? How can I go forward? But how can we come to love each other as we love ourselves? This is really a big piece of it. We look at people as being separate from ourselves, but we're all connected. We're all united. And we're actually all one body, one people, one humanity. So if someone doesn't behave well, we have to work on ourselves not to hurt them back. We have to take responsibility for our own actions. You know, it's interesting, like we say that a hand, all the fingers are separate, but sometimes you can scratch one finger with the other finger and hurt it. And you didn't mean to, you wind up, oh, that was a scratch. And you don't go, you bad finger, you because we realize that we are one. Now, sometimes what happens is that there was a material damage that somebody does something that they hurt something of yours and the person is compensated, but there's still a hurt in your heart and we're told not to take revenge. It's really interesting. The, um, some of you may have heard of Rabbi Scheinberg. He was an amazing, amazing guttel, very big person. He used to wear, I think, 18 sets of talis, a talis cotton, one on top of the other, very high. He was a great person. And I stayed for a few days in somebody's house in Israel. And I turned on the music on a, on a, on a machine. What I didn't realize is that it didn't have the right frequency for Israel and it needed to have something else plugged into it. So it whoop, stopped working. So the question was the halacha. Am I the person that's supposed to do something to pay for it so that she gets it fixed? Or was it her fault to just leave it like that that any normal person would think it's utilizable since it's right there and can be turned on? So we went to Rabbi Scheinberg, who was a big knowledgeable person in halacha. And he said that I had to pay to repair it. But what was so interesting to him is how he said this. He said this to her with so much love. He said, but even though you're not going to pay for the repair, it would be really good if you could get the repair in the same way as if it was you who had to pay the report, the repair. In other words, go to somebody who's going to charge less, who's going to give you a bargain so that she has to pay less as if it was yourself. Now, what happened when we, the two of us left, she and I, we gave each other a big hug. We felt so loved. Nobody felt like we lost or won. Yes, I was going to pay for the repair, but she was gonna be careful to take care of my money as if she would take care of her own. 
that it should be the least possible in the simplest way. And we knew that what the Rav said was so loving to both of us that we just felt really connected. But still, we don't understand what it means to love your, fam your fellow as yourself. Now, Rabbi Akiva says, this is a fundamental principle of the Torah. And Rabbi Hillel says, what is hateful to you, don't do to others. Through our actions, act like you love. So these are two very different pictures. We have to find out how it's different. So Rabbi Akiva just says, love your fellow. It's very interesting that when you love your fellow, you just come from an approach, an attitude of wanting to do good for them. You care about them. But Rabbi Hillel is saying from a different perspective, what's hateful to you, don't do that to others. That means through our actions, act like you love. Ramban says, you can't feel exactly the same about another person. The Ramban says that if a person is in danger, he talks about if two people or few people are hiking in the desert and one person, only one person has some water, according to the halacha, you take priority and you drink the water. So it is an obligation that you have to take care of yourself. But still, there's a feeling of generosity that we want good for the other person. So we need to understand that love doesn't mean to treat someone the way that you want to be treated. It means to treat the other person the way they want to be treated. We need to understand that every person is different. And we need to be sensitive to the other person's feelings. It's funny, you know, that we have our own taste. Some person likes their coffee or their tea. They don't want coffee. They do like tea. They don't like tea. They do like coffee. They like it with sugar. They don't like it sugar. They like it with milk. They like it with oat, oat, oat drink. So when the person says, could you please get me something to drink? We shouldn't be getting them what we know that we like. We should get them we, what we know they like. And if we don't know what they like, we can say, what would you like it to be? Oh, you'd like coffee? How do you like it? Sugar, milk? Because that way we get to take care of them in the way they need to be taken care of. Now, this is something that's seen a, very often. Before Shabbos, uh, a husband or a, a guest could bring flowers. Now, another person knows that flowers are not really appreciated by that person. Well, they like flowers, but that's not what they really need. What would be really meaningful would be, so if the guest says, what could I do to make Shabbos easier for you? The person might, would you like me to bring dessert? Would you like me to bring a kugel? Could I make something for you? <clears throat> would you like me to buy something for you? What can I get for you? that might be more appreciated than the flowers because it will save them more work. Or if you know that bringing wine will save them from having to go to the store to go shopping, maybe that will be helpful. And for a person who has it all together and everything's cooked and done, maybe the flowers are exactly what they want. So the thing is to not to say what I like, I like, flowers or I like this wine, but to talk with them about what they would like or what would make it easier for them. In other words, that the gift that you're giving them is that you're treating them with respect and consideration, something that they want to appreciate. There was a story that I just read, a friend sent it to me, that there was a person in Auschwitz in the concentration camp, who woke up feeling that if he didn't get something substantial to eat, he would not live out the day. He just had that feeling that he had to eat that day. And he went to people one after another, but they didn't have any food to give. 
One person said to him that he didn't have any bread, but he offered him a hug. And he hugged the man. And the man felt really hugged. In looking back at his years in concentration camp, he felt that that was the worst day. But he also felt that this hug turned the situation around. Somehow that hug made him feel cared about and that gave him new life. Sometimes our affection makes someone feel respected and loved. We can greet them with friendliness, help them with what they need. Whatever it is that we do, sometimes it's a physical hug. Sometimes it's an emotional hug. There are all kinds of hugs that people need and want that could make a difference. Sometimes you walk past somebody in the park and just say, you know, just lift your hand and say a hi, that's an acknowledgement. Because sometimes what people need is to be seen. This, we see this, it's interesting because mothers with little children, when the children come home, whatever the parents were doing before that, hi, they look at them with affection and love. Hi, how are you? Come in, how was your day? Come in. We look at them because it's so important for everyone to feel seen. Sometimes we're just in a store. We appreciate what somebody does that makes a difference. And that makes a difference to them. When we appreciate what they do, it makes a difference to them. They may feel that they are working at doing the same thing many times a day. But when you see them and we thank them, they feel that this was special. Someone got what they did, received their action, and knew that it was done, that we knew that it was done by a person not by a robot. And when we thank them for having done this, they feel seen and appreciated. It's so, so important. Sometimes all that someone needs is your time, a call, a cup of coffee together, making a date, recognition. They're seen and appreciated by someone who is giving them what they need. And this is also a simple recognition of our oneness. This is very important. Let's, I wanna talk about this oneness. If somebody does something for me and I say, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I look at them and I say, I really appreciate that. There's a oneness. We're two people, but there's a oneness in this. If I just, as they say, grab my stuff and go, even with a little thanks, then there's me and there's that other person. And there's a complete separateness. And the other person felt she got what she wanted, but she didn't see me. And when I say, thank you so much, that was great. Thanks for packing it up for me. We appreciate that. And you look at them, they feel oneness. I helped her, I made a difference. And she saw that I made a difference. Now, the Hasidic masters say, to love our fellow is to love God. We are the children of God. So when we love a fellow, we are loving God. Instead of seeing another person as a stranger, we can have a perspective that this is a child of God. Like we look at our own child who doesn't behave so well, sometimes we really don't like their behavior, but we know that we're connected. And so we continue to love them. So it's not all about their behavior. It's about who we are and where we're coming from. When I know that we are the children of God, I realize that I love whoever my father loves. If this person is so important to him, I make sure to love them. Now we mentioned the comment of Hillel, that Hillel told in the Talmud. The story is, it's a, it's a little bit of a bigger story. A Gentile came to Shammai and asked him to teach him the whole Torah 
while standing on one foot. He wanted to convert. And it says that Shammai took a, a builder's ruler and chased him away. So then he went to Hillel and Hillel said to him, now for Shammai to say, how can I teach somebody the whole Torah in one foot? That's asking a lot, come on. And his answer was really because he came from Gevura. Gevura is making boundaries. If you're not gonna sit and learn and you don't have patience and you need it on, while I'm standing on one foot, so get out of here, I can't do that for you. But Hillel was a person who came from Chesed, from loving kindness. So he found a way to say it on one foot. And what did he say? What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Now go learn it. So now we have to understand why is, why is he saying this is the whole Torah? Rabbi Kiva said there's a great principle in Torah, but Hillel says this is the whole Torah. So regarding what Hillel said, why is what is hateful to you do not do to your neighbor? Why is that equal to the whole Torah? Because we know that there's much more. There are mitzvahs, commandments of man to man, how we relate to each other, and mitzvahs of man to God, how we relate to God. So how is this teaching relevant between man and God? Now the Alter Rebbe asks, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe asks, this is the essence of all mitzvot. In what way is this the essence of all the mitzvot, including praying and not working on Shabbat? How can we love another person as we love ourself? Are self and the other same? So there is another person. We are two distinct entities. We are. What makes us distinct? We live in two bodies. So we look at ourselves as two. I'm sitting in the chair I'm sitting in, you're sitting in the chair you're sitting in. I'm sitting in the place I'm in, you're in the place that you're in. Each of us has our unique differences. So we look at ourselves as two separate people, not as one. But here's the difference. That perspective has to do with the physical. But when we look at the spiritual perspective, we see both as rooted in the same God and we are one essence. As long as we look at the, this is very important, as long as we look at the physical self as the true self, as the real I, and the soul is something that the body has, then we do not see each other as one then we see that each one is a body. That's the reality if we look at it from the physical perspective. And a soul, yeah, I have a soul, you have a soul, that's really nice. But if we look at the soul as the true I, and the body is the tool and extension of the soul, something the soul has, I am a soul in a body, then we realize that self and other are two expressions of a singular essence. Then we realize that we are one coming from a singular essence. And then we can want for the other what we want for ourselves. <coughs> when we look at another person as a soul, we see beyond physical reality. And then we see the spiritual as the primary role. It's very interesting when it gave the example of the little children coming home or meeting with somebody you really like or getting together like we are right now, that when you see the person deeply and you look at them from your soul into their soul, you feel the oneness. If you look from the superficial, oh, look, she got a haircut. Oh, look, she, now it doesn't mean you don't notice things, but when you're looking from the deep, 
you see deep into another person. Obviously, this needs practice. So when we look at another person as a soul, we see beyond physical reality. And then we see the spiritual as his primary role. Now, Hillel was saying that when we begin with this soul perspective, then all of Torah is seen as coming from what God wants. Now, this is very interesting, very important. We're talking about seeing ourselves as one, not separate that we get that like the fingers of the hand, each one of us is coming from a hand, one hand, which is coming from even higher. And that means that even though we're separate fingers in terms of the utilization of the finger, so you point with this finger, maybe you put your ring on that finger, maybe you grasp things with two or three fingers, and they work together, but they're all part of something that's even bigger than that. It's actually very interesting that when you use your fingers, you can see that up in your, in your arm, that your hand is moving because they're all coming from essence. They're all coming from the soul. They're all coming from one God. So this has to do with our oneness. Now, Hillel was saying that when we begin with this soul perspective, then all of Torah is seen as coming from what God wants. This is very interesting. If we look at all of Torah as coming from what God wants, then no mitzvah is seen as difficult. Why? Because all the mitzvahs are part of the oneness, the oneness of God and the oneness of what God wants. In other words, when we see the oneness of God and God's Torah, then the physical, the physicality of what God wants is all an extension of that oneness because we're able to see beyond the physical reality. So when God is giving us a Torah, whatever God wants is what we wanna do. I was giving the example of somebody is asking for a cup of coffee and you say to them, how would you like your coffee? They say with a uh, rice cream or they say, no, maybe a little honey would be good. No sugar, a little honey. They're being very particular. And if you think of them as separate from you and every action is separate, then you could say, honey, you also want? I have to go look for the honey, that's what you want? So complicated, why don't you just take it straight? But if we really care about them, then we say, whatever you want. I have honey, I have ice cream, we're good. Whatever you like, just a minute, I'll get it for you. The same with God and God's Torah, that when we see that there is oneness in this world and there's one God, and the Torah is the Torah of the one God, one Torah, then we don't say, oh my gosh, that mitzvah seems a little tough. That one seems a little bit, I don't know if I want that one. Okay, I'll do that one. That's like saying, forget about the honey, honey. No, if we really care about God, then we say, I accept your Torah, whatever it is that you want. Now, don't get nervous if you're not up to that, but it's an amazing concept to understand that when we love God, we want to do what God wants. So we can say, God, I wanna do whatever you want me to do. I'm working on it. It's okay to say that I'm working on it. Can't do, even if you take on everything. The truth is even when a person says, God, I realize that the whole Torah is yours and I wanna do everything you want me to do. Nevertheless, there's a process of learning what to do. Actually, that's what Hillel said. Hillel said, this is what to do now. Yeah, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. So be careful with the nose, not to do what is not good. And that you understand from yourself. This is the whole Torah. What does it mean this is the whole Torah? If you start here, the rest is commentary. In other words, if you're not going to, if you recognize your oneness with your neighbor, and you're not going to do what they don't want you to do. 
then what's going to happen is you're coming from that place of oneness. That's the point, to come from the place of oneness. And when you come from the place of oneness, this is the whole Torah and the rest is commentary. And then Hillel says, now go learn it. Go learn it, what does that mean? That means even if the person wants the coffee with the rice cream and the, and the honey, and you say, I thought I had rice cream, I don't have rice cream, but I have this or I have that. That's where you go to a rub to find out what's okay. And then you find it, it will be fine if it is with oat milk, you have oat milk, that's wonderful. Oat milk will be good. And honey is good. Yeah, thank you. That sounds great. And then when we're learning what it is that the one wants, then it is one Torah. And we're recognizing there's one God and one Torah. And then we don't see mitzvahs as difficult. It's all part of the oneness. And that's what we're bringing into the world. Coming back to Ahavas Yisrael, if I feel hurt by another person, that hurtful behavior came from the physical. In other words, why did somebody act that way? I don't know, but everybody is different. People have things that are difficult for them or confusing for them, or they don't know what to do, or they don't know how to handle it. They haven't found their own peace of mind. And so sometimes when they respond to somebody else, it's not with kindness because they, can't, they haven't found their own inner peace at that time. And so they're responding in a way that's not so sensitive. But if I realize that their behavior is coming from their physical understanding, where they are not yet connecting into their soul, because we have to connect into our own souls, I can see that the soul of the other person is pure and I can recognize that we're one. So we also have to know that, that we have to connect into our own souls, that we have to recognize that we are souls with bodies and look deeper. Somebody that I know, I called her up and I said, how are you? And she said, fat. And I said, that's who you are? That's not who you are. And that's not how you are. How are you? In other words, the you is deeper in each of us than sometimes what we think of ourselves. And it's really funny because I spoke to this person recently. I told her that I said this in a class once. And she said, no, I don't think that's who I am. But she said, she really is fat. She still is holding on to it. She's holding on to an outer picture of herself. It's necessary to come to the inner person, the inner soul of who we are. And we come from the inner soul, everything kind of just regulates itself. When we're worrying about what we think other people think, it's very difficult. But when we recognize that we're a soul in a physical, in a body, and that the soul of the other person is pure, and that my own soul is pure, then I can recognize that we're all one. So we are really and truly connected. We are all one soul, but then we branch out from the source where we are truly one. So we're coming from the one God, from then we have our souls that are connected into God, then we become individuals, but we need to know that we're connected in the one God. And when we know we're branched out from the source where we are truly one, that if we can see ourselves this way, then we look at the entire Torah as coming from the one. And this changes how we look at everything. This is who we are. Jews living Torah, this is who we are. And bringing this into the world. And so part of these, the mitzvahs that we're seeing is that we, don't hurt another person. We don't do to another person what they don't want done. And we love our fellow and we rebuke them if they're rebukable. If they're not rebukable that they're gonna gain from it, then we don't. And if we still feel hurt by it, then we need to work it through, whether we talk to a friend or how we work it out, 
till we come to our own inner being where we see that that was superficial. They're, that's coming from that superficial place in another person. But I can see their soul. Now, the Rebbe asks, if we love one another, do we look at the faults of each other? If you see shortcomings in another person, can you still love him? Now, different people have shortcomings. We know this. But we are not to focus on them and then hate them. It's very interesting, you know, that when you look in the mirror, what do you see? We need to look into our eyes and see our beauty. I have a friend, she, I visit, visit her once in a place that she used to live. She doesn't live in California. And it was so interesting. I sat down on a couch. She walked past me. She was walking with her regular, happy, enthusiastic way of walking. She stopped in front of me, looked above my head, and suddenly she went, and, that, and then she went like this, a not very positive look. And then after that, she stood up again, and she walked her happy, beautiful self away. I thought, whoa, what just happened? So I looked above myself and there was a mirror. But you could see that what happened was that she had a thought in her head that she wasn't beautiful. So the thought came, so she, she is beautiful. The thought came before she looked in the mirror. So the thought was like, Eef. then she looked in the mirror with that thought that she doesn't look beautiful. What she saw was that funny face she made that wasn't so beautiful. That's what she saw. Then she said, like, what could you do? Of course, that's real. And then she just became her beautiful, happy self and walked away. So what we bring to the mirror is how we think in the first place. When we look at ourselves with a smile in a beautiful way, look in our eyes, we can see that there is more to us than what we see because we have souls. That's who we really are. Now, if you have a little pimple, so you have a little pimple. It's so superficial, it's not who we are. So we don't wanna look at the pimples on another person and focus on them and then hate them. So you see their shortcomings, but you continue to love them. So loving another is not being indifferent to his faults. It's okay. But it helps to accept the paradox that we see our own faults and our own shortcomings, but we continue to love ourselves. Okay, so I'm not perfect, but I love myself anyway. And we make excuses for our shortcomings. We justify our behavior because, you know, like I said, if you have a pimple, it's not who you are. So what? Just let it go. You wanna put some clay on it at night, that will dissolve it. But it's not something you don't see and it's not something you might not wanna take care of, but it's not who you are. So we can do the same for others. See why they're not, see how they're not perfect, but continue to respect them and see them as a child of God. So you have to see ourselves as a child of God, loved by God. We have to see our fellow as a child of God, loved by God. So Hashem wants us to forgive, not to be judgmental. And how we treat others is how we want to be treated ourselves. We don't know what they went through. No person has the same life experiences, but we accept and do what we can to understand ourselves. So the Ramban says that in our practical action, we need to treat others with respect and love like they want to be treated. The Holy Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, who lived from 1698 to 1760, and he was the founder of the Hasidic movement. He was offered orphaned from his father, Rabbi Eliezer, at the age of five, five years old. The last words spoken to him by his father before his passing were Yisraelic, fear nothing but God alone. Love every single Jew. 
without exception, with the full depth of your heart and with the fire of your soul, no matter who he is or how he behaves. Actually, the Baal Shem Tov's mother passed away shortly after. And his father's final words not only shaped the Baal Shem Tov and his personal life, but he did what he could to help and uplift other people. That was his whole life. And he founded Hasidim, Hasidism. So knowing that all deserve love because they're a child of God was a major principle in the founding of Hasidus. It's also clear that the mitzvah to love your fellow as yourself must begin with nurturing a true love and respect for yourself. These days they talk about self-care. So that's good too. I wanna to put a little clay on that little pimple, then do it and it will disappear. Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, the sixth Chabad Lubavitch Rebbe said that the prohibition against gossip includes gossiping about yourself. You may not talk badly about yourself. You may not even think that you're bad. No matter how negative and harmful your actions might be, it does not make you evil. And a person should not, according to, to the previous Rebbe, do not ever let your wrongdoings tarnish your self-perspective. You're always a child of God. You are good. That's really important to know that God makes each of us special and unique and that we need to know our goodness. Every person has made mistakes in life. Every person has said things they shouldn't say. Sometimes we apologize, sometimes we didn't. But we don't have to, it's not good to identify with the mistakes. To look at the mistakes, and the mistakes should only be looked at, let's say once a week, if there's something you could do about it. Some people even less. Because we're in, it's not good for us to talk badly about ourselves and to think badly of ourselves. Because if we think that we're the worst, how can we think we're the same as a fellow Jew and love him? Because it has to love a fellow as you love yourself. So you have to be able to love yourself in order to love somebody else. So when you love yourself, then you can love your fellow Jew. Now the Alter Rebbe tells us that each of us needs to train oneself to see the soul as essential and primary and the body as working to bring soul into our daily lives. It's very important. This is something that we need to train ourselves. It's very interesting that when some, many women, when somebody says to them, oh, you look wonderful today, says, oh, come on, I look terrible today. That's not a good thing to do. If a person says to you, you look wonderful today, then you say, thank you. What happens if you think you don't look wonderful? So they think you do. Let them be right. Say thank you. Don't have to fight that. Just let it be. Some time ago, I was very tired. I didn't feel so well, I was just very tired. And so I just said, I have to just take the day off, I'm gonna rest. And then in the evening, I saw somebody and she said to me, you look wonderful. You look so rested. Now, my first inner thought was, oh, come on. Did I rest enough? My second thought was, if she says I look wonderful and rested, I'm going to say, thank you. And that was so good for me to think of myself as good on the physical level. Good. So this is something we need to work on, to train ourselves, to see the soul as essential and primary and the body as working to bring soul into our daily lives. And when we think of soul as being essential, then how we be behave with other people is going to be much more loving. 
So we can help others if we see what they need, if we can help them. And if we can't, sometimes what we're going to say they won't hear, then we can continue to accept them with love. So even if it's somebody that we feel is not living up to what they could be living, okay, they will when they get around to it, but we can accept them with love. So it's clear that the mitzvah to love your fellow as yourself has to begin with nurturing a true love and respect for yourself. So when the Friedrich Rebbe, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe said the prohibition against gossip includes gossiping about oneself, that is part of the habit that we're learning not to talk badly about ourselves, not to even think you're bad, no matter how negative or harmful your actions may be, doesn't make you evil. So if you think not to let our errors take away from our self perspective and not to let the errors of the other person take away from their perspective. Now we may distance ourselves from behaviors that we do, we're supposed to do that. I mean, we may distance ourselves a little bit from somebody who is generally hurtful, that's okay. We don't have to hate them. We could love them, we say, well, that's what they're up to right now. That's how far they got. So I wanna tell you a little short true story that somebody sent me. Second. Some of you may have heard of the Klausenberg, Klausenberger Rebbe. who was a Hasidic Rebbe, an amazing Rebbe. He's the one who, he began a hospital that has a, ra a rabbi on top, figuring out what should be done according to the halacha. He was in the concentration camps and he basically lost his whole family. And he said, He once told someone, there's one thing I miss about the Holocaust. And you have to remember, this is a major Hasidic Rebbe, famous, well-known. People came to him for advice and blessings, but he was in the Holocaust with other people. He said, when we went on the death march, we were all clean shaven and our hair was shaved off too. He had payas usually, and a short haircut, but he said that we marched side by side and no one knew if the person next to them was a chassid, who usually has a beard, or a litvak, who often doesn't. No one knew I was a rebbe. They just walked by next to each other with no identifying characteristics to explain the difference this is a very high person. This is a, a regular person. This is someone who does it this way. That's someone who does it that way. He said, the Rebbe said, the Klausenberger Rebbe said, we all just held our arms around each other and tried to keep warm and tried to keep our fellow Jews warm. That's what I miss from the Holocaust. It's an amazing, amazing statement that what he appreciated was not believing that your role is who you are. Your role allows you to do things in the world. He came out and made this amazing hospital, Ladiano, some of you may have heard of it. He made Ladiano Hospital, a hospital with, that is so dedicated to healing people, really healing people. And that came from his love of a fellow Jew, his awareness of the oneness of each one. And so this is also a statement of recognizing that we don't have to look at each other as roles. You know, you're, you're the person who bags the food in the supermarket. I am the person who bought the, super, the food in the supermarket. No, I'm a person, you're a person. And when I look at them and I say, Thank you so much. I really appreciate that you put that in two bags. That's gonna make it so much easier for me to carry. The person says, wow, she realizes that I thought to help her. She got that. That's so nice. So we need to remember that each of us is always a child of God. We're good. 
Each of us is special and unique because God made us and placed us in our own unique situation as our own, with our own unique personality in the way that God wants us to be. So God is giving us an opportunity by making us unique. When we love ourselves and we love our fellow, then this love connects us to God and to our oneness. And it helps us to know who we really, really are. So may Hashem, may God bless us to know who we really, really are and be who we really are and have joy in who we are and have joy in meeting each other and appreciating each other. And may, this also brings our holiness. Be blessed.